And so in Luke, the third chapter, I want to read two verses. That's verse 15 and 16. I want to read that together. Everybody in Luke, the third chapter? All right, so let's read verses 15 and 16 together. Ready? Read. Now, as the people were in expectation and all reasoned in their hearts about John, whether he was the Christ or not, John answered, saying to all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I is coming, whose sandal straps I am not worthy to loose. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Glory to God. And so we've been in this series on the Spirit of God for weeks and weeks and weeks, and the first part of it, we looked at the Spirit of God on the inside of us that we receive when we accept Jesus as Lord, amen? And the Spirit of God comes to live on the inside of us, and we unpacked that and looked at all the different ways that that impacts us and what we have at our disposal as a result of it. And then we shifted over into this second major work of the Holy Spirit that John is talking about here when, he, when people are asking, are you the Christ? And he told them all, I am not the Christ. And then he told them about the one that was coming. And it's interesting what he said about the one that was coming. He could have said a lot of things about the one that was coming. Amen. He could have talked about how he was going to heal and work miracles and, and save us from our sin. He could have said a whole lot of things. But the thing that he chose to say was that when he comes, he will baptize with the Holy Spirit and fire. And so one of the major points that we have made in this part of this series is that to bring the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a stated reason that Jesus came. It's not inferred. It's not assumed. It's not pieced together and read into. It's stated. And what that means is, is that it is a critical, important part of what Jesus came for. And a lot of times we, um, we kind of put this down, kind of lower, ignore it. We don't put it on the same level. For example, one of the stated reasons Jesus came was to redeem us from sin. That's stated. Amen? And we talk about that, how Jesus came to redeem us from sin and from the effects of sin, which is, which is uh, death and sickness and disease and poverty and all these things. And we talk about that, but we don't talk as much about the reality that Christ came to bring us the baptism of the Holy Spirit. If you listen to John. Am I right about it? Stated reason. And from that, we... We understand, hear this, that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a part of the plan of God for every believer because Jesus came to bring it. I mean, he came to bring it. And so if he came to bring it, his intention is that his people receive it. And so those are two critical pieces that it's a stated reason and that it's the plan of God for every person. So in the book, that, that contains the days of our life as talked about in Psalm 139. There's a book was written with all of our days before any of them were fashioned. A part of what's in that book is that sister so-and-so would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Brother so-and-so would receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's a part of his plan. Then we started to look at, well, what, what comes with this experience? What is it that this experience brings us, because we also pointed out that, that or we, we'll look at it right now. Turn to Luke 24. And when you look at the things that are said about this experience, it really does reveal to us that this should be an important part of our lives and, and our relationship with God. So in Luke, the 24th chapter, this is after Jesus was resurrected, before he uh, ascended, it says this. And, well, for time's sake, I'll just read right, in, in, read, read right into it in verse 49. Everybody in Luke 24. So verse 49, Jesus says, Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but wait in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. So Jesus tells them to, to wait in Jerusalem until you 
and receive the promise of, of the Father. We'll see specifically what that is in a minute. But when you receive it, you will receive power. Let me hear you say power. power. Say it with some attitude. Power. power. Glory to God. Now, the word endued, we talked about this. Did we talk? No, because I didn't get to preach last Sunday, so we didn't talk about this. The word endued, I think we did talk about this. The word endued is a word that means to slip into like a garment, to be clothed or to be arrayed. So Jesus is saying that when you receive the promise of the Father, you will be clothed, you will be arrayed in power. And the word power, as many know, is the Greek word dunamis. It's where we get the English word dynamite from. And the, the literal definition is miraculous power. Miraculous power. Force. So Jesus is saying, when you receive the promise of the Father, you will be clothed in, arrayed in, slip into a garment. Power miraculous power not just any kind of power but miraculous power now let's flip over to Acts chapter 1 and this will tie it all together and then we can get started verse 4 of Acts chapter 1 and being assembled together with them he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard of me. So he's talking about the promise of the Father that we just looked at in Luke 24. Am I right about it? So then he goes on to explain the promise of the Father, which you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So the promise of the Father is the same thing that John talked about, that Jesus came to bring the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now let's jump down. So then they ask him a question, and he basically says, none of your business. But I'll tell you what your business is in verse 8. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the end of the earth. So a few things that we want to pull out of this. Again, Jesus said, you shall receive power. The other thing we want to pull out of this main thing is this. Jesus told them in verse 4, don't go anywhere, don't do anything until you get clothed in this power. Basically saying, I've been resurrected, I'm coming in glory, all authority has been given to me, you've been born again, the Spirit of God is living on the inside of you, but you still don't have everything you need. So wait for this thing that you lack that you need, which is the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so last week we started looking at, well, what, what happens with the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or two weeks ago, and we looked at the fact that it changed their attitude. It changed their approach to life. They had a new boldness. They had a new fire. They had a new zeal. They had a new attitude. Because when those same religious leaders that crucified Jesus 50 days ago arrested them just like Jesus and said, stop talking about Jesus, they said, whether it's in the right in the sight of God to listen to you more than him, you judge. It changed them. Because, see, after they had crucified Jesus, they were afraid but they're not afraid anymore. So we looked at that the, the baptism of the Holy Spirit changes the attitude. It gives us a fire. It gives us a courage, a, a, a boldness. But today I want to look at the other major thing that comes with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. I want to talk today about what it, after we look at it, is what does it mean for us? Because at the end of the day, all of this is about what does it mean for us? Amen. This, this book is a living book. And so when we read it, what does this mean for me? So, I want to start in Mark, uh, Matthew, I'm sorry, the fourth chapter. And so we're just going to kind of march throughout this and just look at what happened to people after the Spirit of God came upon them. Anybody interested? 
So in Matthew chapter 4, well, let me back up. So Matthew 3, I'm just going to read this real quick just for context. So in Matthew chapter 3, the Spirit of God descends upon Jesus. So in verse 16, when he had been baptized, of Matthew 3, when he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and the, behold, the heavens opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending on him like a dove and alighting upon him. That word alighting means remaining. So the Spirit of God comes upon Jesus. In the, at the end of chapter 3, the beginning of chapter 4, we see that he's driven into the wilderness to be tempted, and then let's go over to, so that whole thing happens, and the next thing that we see is he picks his disciples. Then, verse 23, then Jesus went about Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of diseases among them. Then his fame went throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. So we see Jesus start to operate in power that he didn't have before because we hear nothing about healings and miracles before Jesus, the Spirit of God, comes upon him. But as a result, we start seeing him move with great power. Now let's look at Matthew, uh, Mark chapter 1. So in Mark chapter 1, I'm just going to read verse 9 for context. So you see that this is, he's received, the Spirit of God comes upon him. It came to pass in those days, Jesus came, by, came from Nazareth to Galilee, was baptized by John. Immediately coming up from the water, we saw the heavens open and the Spirit descending upon him like a dove. So the Spirit of God comes upon him. Then, just like in Matthew, we see that he, in verse 13, he, he was driven into the wilderness to be tempted by Satan. Then we also see that in verse 20, he has started calling his disciples. And then let's look at verse 24, 21. Well, no, let's back up. Let's look at verse, yeah, 21. Then they went to Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath day, he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as having great authority and not like the scribes. Now there was a man in their synagogue with an unclean spirit. He cried out, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be quiet, come out of him. When the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out. Then get verse 27. All were amazed. So again, Jesus begins to demonstrate the power of God in a way that we didn't see before. Y'all following? And note, as we go through this, the reaction from people. They're astonished. They're amazed. All right, now let's go to John chapter 1. So John chapter 1, verse 32, John bore witness... Uh, this is for context I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him so this is that same encounter now let's look and see what happens next verse uh, he starts calling his disciples and I want you to see what happens here verse 45 and he found Nathaniel Philip found Nathaniel and said to him we have found him of whom Moses and the law and the other prophets wrote Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Philip, uh, Philip said, come see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming and said to him, behold, an Israelite, and indeed in whom is no deceit. So Nathanael like, well, how you know me? You don't know, you don't, you don't know me like that. And Jesus answered and said, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. So now we see Jesus starting to operate in word of knowledge and visions. I saw you before he came to get you. 
And I know that you, there's no guile in you. So we start seeing the supernatural start to occur. Then chapter 2 of Luke 1 is the whole wedding of Cana, where he turned the water into wine. So we see that following the Spirit of God coming upon him, he begins to operate in great power. Now let's jump over to Acts chapter 1, 2. Acts chapter 2. Y'all with me so far? Let me hear you say power. power. See, see, listen. God intended that his children walked in power. He didn't intend that his children walk around all beat up and beat down and afraid and weak. Because they were that before Jesus came. So Acts chapter 2, you all know this. This is, when the, uh, this is the day of Pentecost. And so um, I'll read into this. When the day of Pentecost, verse 1, had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire and set upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And so they have this supernatural experience where they begin to speak in other tongues. And we read several weeks ago and, and showed scripturally that this is the baptism of the Holy Spirit that Jesus was telling them to wait for. And we looked at Acts chapter 2 a little bit later on when it tied all that together. I won't do that uh, today, but just know that that's what that is. So then they began to spill out into the streets, and I'm just going to just point this out in verse 12. So they were all amazed. You see that? And perplexed, saying one to another, what could this mean? So, so they have this experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. The first thing that immediately happens is they have the supernatural experience where they speak in other tongues. So it be, supernatural things start happening immediately. Right now, let's go over to Acts chapter 3. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms of those who entered the temple, who seeing Peter and John about to go in the temple asked for money. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look on us. And he looked at them expecting to receive some money. Then Peter said, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So again, we see the power. Following this experience, it comes with power. Now, lest you think this is only for preachers, because that's one of the problems. We think the preachers are the only people supposed to move in power and supposed to see supernatural happening. But I want to draw your attention to, you don't have to turn there for time, but Acts chapter 12 is when uh, Peter had gotten arrested. They had, they had beheaded John, the brother of James, James, the brother of John. James, John. One of them J's. <laughs> and so next they grabbed Peter, snatched Peter up. And they were going to kill Peter. And so it says in Acts chapter 12 that the brethren and the sistering got together and prayed continuously. So all the believers get together and pray. And you remember what happened. An angel shows up while Peter's locked up, looses the bands, lets him out the gate, takes him out the city, disappears. That was from the believers praying, not, not the preachers. Amen? So then we see here with Jesus, and then we see with the apostles in the early church, that following the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they start walking in power. Now let's go back in Acts to Acts chapter 2. So this was after they had this experience. They go out in the streets and everybody's like, we are hearing this stuff in our own language. Verse 14, Peter standing up with the eleven raised his voice and said to them, men of Judah and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let it be known to you and listen to what I got to say. But these are not drunk as you suppose since it's only nine o'clock in the morning. But this is that that was spoken by the prophet Joel. So he's saying, Joel prophesied this hundreds of years ago, but get what Joel said. 
in the, it shall come to pass in the last day, says God, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. Well, what's going to happen when you do that? Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. And on my maid servants and men servants, I will pour out of my spirit in those days and they shall prophesy. So when this happens, supernatural power will begin to be manifested in their lives. That was what Joel said back in, the, in, in before it ever happened. And he said, when it happens, he said the same thing that Jesus said, power. Now, this word prophecy is an interesting word because it has two definitions. And I'm telling you this now because we'll be talking about it in the weeks to come. And the two, it means two things. To foretell events. But it also means to speak under inspiration. So from this, we learn that prophecy has two different and distinct um, workings. One is to foretell, and the other is to speak under, uh, under inspiration. That's what happened last Sunday. I'm just going to throw that out there. When all those people came up and they just spoke by the Spirit of God, they were inspired. Amen? That's why you see people like Linda who you don't say much of nothing. And she come up here and start preaching. Inspired. Glory to God. And then, so just for completeness sake, the definition, the word uh, visions is an inspired appearance. And dreams is, the, is something seen in sleep. So when this comes, supernatural things begin to happen. Amen? So that's three. Jesus, the apostles, Joel. Now let's speed it up into more recent times. And one of the things that we see, for those who, who are interested in history and, and, and great men and women of God and moves of God, one of the things that you see is there is a clear definitive connection between the power of God being manifested and the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It's like a delineation in the people's lives. And so I've been reading this book. Again, I probably read, I've read it a bunch. God's Generals. Y'all see it's a new book. It's new because my firstborn took my old copy <laughs> when he went to school. So I said, nope, take it. I'll go get me a new copy. God's general. So this just chronicles, it's a history book basically about great men and women of God throughout the re recent, more recent history. And so there are people in here like Amy, McPhil McPh Amy Simple McPherson, Ariah Woodworth Etter, Smith Wigglesworth, John Lake, uh, William Branham, A.A. A. Allen, just a bunch of people. And it chronicles their life. And one of the things that you see is the precursor is the baptism of the Holy Spirit the precursor to power. So I want to I wanna read you some things from in this book. How many of y'all have heard of Charles Parham? Charles Parham is called the father of Pentecost. He was the one who basically the, uh, the, the, the revelation of the truth that the baptism of the Holy Spirit comes with speaking in tongues. He was the guy. If you trace that back to his history, that's where it started in America. So he had this experience where he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit and then you know, his, his ministry just kind of exploded, right? So this is a couple things that happened in his life. It says, once in a service, he began to speak in other tongues, and when he finished, a man in the congregation stood up and said, I am healed of my infidelity. Oh, we need more people to say that. I'm healed of my infidelity. It means I'm an infidel, no longer. He said, I have heard in my own language the 23rd Psalm that I learned at my mother's knee. So Charles Parham's up preaching, and he just has an utterance in tongues, and it's that man's native language. And he recites the 23rd Psalm that this man had taught, that his mother taught him, and he got converted. Power. Signs and wonders. How many of y'all know that dude was like, whoa, what meaneth this? Once, after taking a drink of water on the platform, Parham doubled over with tremendous pain. He began to pray, and the pain left instantly. Later, when the water was tested, it was found to contain enough poison to kill a dozen men. 
signs and wonders. Miraculous power. Following the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now stay with me, I'm going somewhere. Now, how many of y'all have ever heard of Azusa Street? And you all know that the catalyst for Azusa Street was William Seymour, who came out of Charles Parham's Bible school, Bible school in Houston, Texas, and then he felt led of God to go to Los Angeles. And he went, not having the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but Charles Parham excited him, inspired him, and so he went to Los Angeles to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And so people started gathering with him. And so they're all just seeking the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And then the Spirit of God gets poured out, and then Azusa Street became a thing. But one of the things that was the hallmark of Azusa Street, and we need to hear this, is Azusa Street was not about a person. The, just the people in general were used by God because the people received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And I said before, it's not about preachers. See, it's about the baptism. And so preacher or no, if you receive the baptism, you receive power. So get this about Azusa. Because there was no program, somebody would finally rise anointed to bring forth the message. The speaker could be of any age, race, or gender. Everyone felt that God was responsible for the altar calls, which could take place at any point. Sermons inspired in English or in other languages with interpretation. And it's just people. So it's just a meeting just like this. And they had one of the things that we don't, patience. Because if I came in here and just stood for 20 minutes, I kind of did that last Sunday, though, didn't I? And you see what happened. So they just wait. And then somebody would get up inspired. Just a regular old person. Not William Seymour. Not some preacher with degrees behind his name. A person baptized in the Holy Spirit. Of any age, race, or gender. Which all of those three were big deals back then. And, and excluded people. But not when the Spirit of God gets poured out. Now get this. Members of Azusa Street carried tiny bottles of oil wherever they went. They would knock on doors and witness and pray for the sick throughout Los Angeles. Just regular people. Just regular people. You know why? Because I have power. And so now today... Somebody tell you, oh, yeah, you know, the doctor just, I just got a cancer diagnosis. You know what we say? Well, come to my church on Sunday, and we'll have a pastor pray for you. You pray. Amen. The baptism of the Holy Spirit brings you power. Now, if you haven't had that experience, then there's a level of power that you lack. You still have power because we have power when the Spirit of God lives on the inside of us. But the baptism brings this, uh this elevation of power. Don't, don't, don't bring them to me. I got stuff to do. You pray for them. Amen. Don't call me. Call me with the testimony afterwards. <laughs> Pastor Noel, I prayed for somebody. The power of God hit that place. They got totally healed. Oh, praise God. Thank you for sharing that. They just regular people, just regular sister so-and-so, baptized in the Holy Spirit with power, walking the streets with a bottle of oil, witnessing, praying for the sick. So you see, again, this, the baptism of the Holy Spirit is accompanied with this demonstration of power. And we today have dumbed it down. John Lake. How many of y'all are familiar with John Lake? I read, he, he was burned into my mind when I read this book 20 years ago. Let me tell you about John Lake. It opens up with this. I said to the scientists, gentlemen, I want you to see one more thing. Go down to your hospital and bring back a man who has inflammation in the bone. I'm guessing that was leukemia, bone cancer. 
Take your instruments and attach it to his leg. Leave enough room to get my hand on his leg. They did this, and I put my hand on his shin and prayed like Mother Edder prays. Then I asked, gentlemen, what is taking place? They replied, every cell is responding. Now, you know you got power when you tell them to go down to the hospital and bring you somebody. And hook your instruments up. And the body responded to the power. Now, 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 now hear this. This is, this is John G. Lake, a quote from him. And this was after he received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. This is what he said. When the phenomenon had passed, the glory of it remained in my soul. So here's what this means. This thing that we've done, where we relegate it to an event that happened at some point in the past, and we leave it there, it's supposed to go with us every day. It's supposed to change us going forward. So he said, it remained in my soul. I found that in my life began to manifest a varied, wide range of the gifts of the Spirit. Power. See, that's what Jesus said. The problem is, how come what Jesus said isn't happening today more than it is? He said, and I spoke in tongues by the power of God, and God flowed through me with a new force. Then he said, healings were more of a powerful order. The baptism of the Holy Spirit clothes us in power. Now I want to read you all this because it's too, it's too long for me to type. So John Lake went to Africa. He felt the Lord call him to go to Africa. So he goes to Africa. Whew, glory to God. Mm, if we only realized what we have access to. As the team landed in Africa in January of 1910, a plague was raging over portion of the, portions of the nation. In less than a month, one quarter of the entire population had died. So this ain't, this ain't the flu. It's not a cold. It's wiping out a quarter of the population. In fact, the plague was so contagious that the government was offering $1,000 to any nurse who would care for the sick. Now remember, this is 1910. $1,000 in 1910? That was tens of thousands. That was bank. And so it's so severe, they're paying nurses to just, just, if you just go care for these sick people. Lake and his associates would help free of charge. He and one assistant would go up into the house and bring out the dead and bury them. But no symptom of the plague ever touched him. At the height of the horrible plague, a doctor sent for Lake and asked him, what have you been doing to protect yourself? You must have a secret. See, I told you, when we start demonstrating the power of God, people get perplexed. People get astounded and amazed. How is it you can take these dead people and bury them and nothing happened to you? Now, you know you did something when a doctor called and asked you something. Then Lake responded, Brother, it is the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. I believe that just as long as I keep my soul in contact with the living God so that his spirit is flowing in my soul and my body, then no germ will ever attach itself to me for the spirit of God will kill it. That's big talk. But listen what happened next. Lake then invited the doctor to experiment with him. He asked the doctor to take the foam from the lungs of a dead plague victim and put it under a microscope. The doctor did so and found masses of living germs. Then Lake astounded the people in the room as he told the doctor to spread the deadly foam on my hands and announced that the germs would die. 
The doctor who did, who, the doctor did so and found that the germs died instantly in Lake's hand. Now, here's the upshot. Y'all ready? Y'all with me? If you have been baptized in the Holy Spirit, you had the same experience they had. You had the same experience Jesus had, the same experience the apostles had, the same experience Joel talked about, the same experience John Lake had, Charles Parham, William Branham. The same experience. You got baptized with the same Spirit. It's not, a, it's not a lesser experience for us. It's the same experience. Amen. When the Spirit of God fell here those few weeks ago and five of our young adults received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, same experience. Same experience. Let me hear you say, it's the same experience. You know, there's no Holy Ghost Junior. Amen. You got baptized with little Holy Spirit. No, the, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of God. The power of God is the power of God. And Jesus said, when you receive the promise, you'll receive power. That's what Jesus said. So then when we had that experience, we received But you know the difference? Our expectation. We don't expect to see miracles and signs and wonders from our hands. But it's the same experience. It's the same spirit. It's the same power. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. So you see, we need to amp up our expectation because what we do again, we relegate it to some experience that we had. And oh, it was nice. Oh, it was, oh, I shook and I did backflips and woo, it was glorious. Well, what about now? That same power is available. Now, if you haven't received that experience, you can, you can receive it. Amen. But I'm telling you, it's different. Listen, let's, let's, let's think about this. Let's even bring it down to today. Now, let's say you need a show enough miracle. Somebody say show enough miracle. But you know, you know it ain't one of those, you know, like, you know, I got a, you know, <coughs> I got a little cough. It's like you need for real. You need to touch heaven. Anybody ever been there? Now, I want you to think about the people you'll call to pray for you. Who are you calling? And ask yourself, have they been baptized in the Holy Spirit or not? You calling people who fire baptized when you're trying to get an answer from God. Let's keep it at today. Alan, just last week, it was amazing how casual he said this. When he first came to this ministry, he had been diagnosed with stage four cancer. Stage four. And so, my wife, who else? Who else prayed? Tracy? Linda? Who, me? I, it wasn't me. Because I ain't, y'all ain't going to, y'all not going to kill me. I ain't doing everything. Mm -hmm. LaShonda. They prayed for Alan, and he went back, and they were like, we don't see any cancer. That's like, Three months ago, four months ago. That's, we bringing that right down to today. But what do you know about these four women? Baptized in the Holy Spirit. But see, that should be more of us than what we're seeing. Y'all following me today? See, we are supposed to be operating in power. And so we have to, we have to take on this, 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 this truth that we are clothed with power. Amen. Whatever I face, I've got enough power to deal with it. Whatever you bring me, whatever I encounter, I have 
power. Stop calling other people. Fix your own problems through the power of God. Hey Amen. I might start hanging up on y'all. But one of the things I know that's characteristic of today is so many people want somebody else to do it for them. I'm telling y'all, you know what I'm going to start doing? When people call me talking about I need you to pray for me, I'm going to be like, meet me at the church in an hour. We can pray together. You know what happens then? I start getting fewer calls. <laughs> yeah, meet me at the church. We'll pray for an hour. We'll get your problem solved. Come on. So whoever the first person, I'm telling, I told you. <laughs> so again, if we have received this experience, it's the same experience John Lake had. The experience about which he said, it remained in my soul, and I started seeing the gifts of the Spirit in operation and healings of a much greater order. Same, same experience. Same experience. Amen. And one of the things that we have to do, I'm going to throw this in for free. I'm not going to charge you. One of the things that we have to do is we have to stop relegating the baptism of the Holy Spirit to speaking in tongues. See, we overemphasize that, and then people get the impression that that's it. That's not it. The only reason the tongues came was because the power came. You didn't receive tongues, you received power. Y'all following me? It's, not, it's power. The tongues came because of the power, and the power brings other things as well. So I'm going to tell you what we're getting ready to do. I'm getting ready to start a series on what we call the gifts of the Spirit. One of the first things we'll see is that's not actually the right title, but I ain't trying to argue with nobody about it. Because one of the things that it opens the door to, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it opens the door to the gifts of the Spirit. And one of the things that I know is the more you preach on something, the more you see it. How many of y'all knew that? You start talking about faith, people start getting more faith. You start talking about healing, people start being healed. You start talking about finances, people's finances start getting... Whatever you preach about, it brings faith and then we start to see more of it. It brings awareness. Now, I have considered teaching on the, 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 the gifts of the Spirit over the years and I never got a release from God to do it. I just, I always felt like it's just not time. I wanted to. Because, you know why I wanted to? Because I know if you preach it, then you see it. But I never got released from God until now. Which means it's time for us to see it start being released more in our ministry. That's what it means. It's time. Glory to God. Glory to God. And so I'm excited. And so in the weeks to come, we're going to go through that whole list and talk about what it is, maybe what it isn't, and, and we'll start seeing more of it. I remember I've done it a couple, maybe one or two times, no, once, it, on Wednesday night. I talked about the gifts, the gifts of the Spirit on Wednesday night, and then we had a believers meeting. And for those of you all who were there, you will remember this. We had... A word of knowledge happened right in the service. One of the people said, there's somebody in here that's, that's got chronic headaches. Not just have a headache every now and then, but headaches. And then there's somebody else, I can't remember, it was like a leg, problem with the leg or something. And this was maybe the week after that I, that I taught on the gifts of the Spirit in the Wednesday night. And it was, there was somebody in the room that had chronic headaches, and it wasn't like it was 7,000 people here. All right. It was, it, in fact, it was embarrassingly small number of people here. <laughs> and somebody had a problem with their leg. Word of knowledge, right there, boom. Both of them got prayed for, and as far as I know, both of them got healed. As 
far as I know, I don't remember specifically, but I'm pretty sure both of them were healed. So I'm excited about what's ahead because it's time for us to, to, to bring the experience to today and stop leaving it 10 years ago, 6 months ago, 5 years ago. Amen? It's time to kick that door open into the supernatural and walk through it and begin to demonstrate the power of God. Because the reality is, family, if we're not demonstrating the power of God, we are doing God a disservice. Amen. Doesn't mean we're bad Christians. Doesn't mean we're not going to heaven. But God intended that his people live and demonstrate power. Amen. Let me hear you say power. power. So I'm going to stop right there. But I'm excited, family. It's time. Let me you say it's time. time. Turn to your neighbor and tell him it's time. It's time. Glory to God. And then first is move forward, move forward together. Confidence, taking back the land he's promised, we will not forget.